this would be the third week in a row that I feature John Schmidt. Is that too much, John Schmidt? Nah. Let's go. Welcome to this week's Rack of the Week. This is the first rack of a run. John looks like he's going to grab the head ball and put it over here based on where the cue ball is, but for some reason, he goes to the other side of the rack and sets himself up for a really long break shot. I guess he's just kind of challenging himself to get this run going, and he almost scratches on this break shot, so I don't think there's a lot to be said about that. He just chose to do something different to get the rack started. Um, he has no shot to begin. Not a no good shot. The only shot he has is the nine ball up in this corner pocket. This is the reason why you play on five inch pockets because on four and a half inch pockets, any player in the world is going to miss this shot sometimes. But on five inch pockets, you can shoot this without hitting it very hard. You should be able to make that almost all the time. Now, John immediately goes to this striped ball because he can see it. And I think there's a reason why. Obviously, he has three easier shots. He can shoot this ball on the side. He can shoot the 10 and shoot the 12. Those don't lead to anything. Last week, I mentioned progressing the rack. Shooting the 11 leads to something because you're removing a blocker ball. That blocks the pocket for the 1. So it's the right shot rather than shooting the 10. Also, the 10 could potentially become a brick ball, although we in, later in this rack, John chooses not to use that and to manufacture one. But the 11 ball is the right shot here for that reason. And I know if I was shooting the 11, what I would try to do is bring the cue ball back this way. And, and my reasoning would be I'm playing position for more than one ball. I'll, I'll have a shot on the 15 or I'll have a shot on the 2. But I, I'm, this is one of the things that John did all week long that I'm really going to incorporate in my game. And that is bring the cue ball back to center table. Now, by center table, what I mean is the area above the rack or up here. In other words, not, he didn't stay below. There's no, now, if there was a trouble ball below, he might have done something to deal with it. But there, these are not trouble balls. Every one of them goes. Now John can use these balls to position to do something else. For example, he could shoot the 5 or the 12 and get an angle on the 10 to send the cue ball into the here. Now, I don't think that's a wise shot, and he's not going to do that. But he sees a re-break shot that addresses this cluster in the middle of the table, and that is this one ball. And so we can look at that as a three-shot sequence. I talk about three-shot three sequences a lot. The ball on the side gave him the correct angle on the 10 ball to get the correct angle on the shot that's going to re-break the cluster. So... Uh, so that removes three balls from the table and achieves a goal. Each one of those shots had a purpose. Now this re-break shot can go uh, well in a lot of ways. And the reason why is the 15 and the 2 are still there. So he has an insurance ball into both pockets. So that's an advantage uh, over what I suggested was keeping the cue ball below. I would have had to shoot one of those balls off. So I'm shooting off my insurance balls. This way, the way that John did it, he's preserving his insurance balls. Now, he's going to try and send the cue ball into the 14. You can't, it's very hard to predict if you're going to hit it full or to the left or the right. If the, if the cue ball goes, uh, hits it on this side and the cue ball goes this way, then the 14 could, could bump the 6 and make it into a break ball. The cue ball will go this way and he'll likely have a shot on the 2 ball next. If not, it could come clear and he'll have a shot on this ball in the side pocket next. Look at the other alternative. If the cue ball hits this side of the 14, that knocks the 14 this way. That might make the 8 ball into a break ball. The cue ball will go this way. It might hit the 6 or, or it might not. The cue ball will be here. He might have a shot on the 15 or on this ball on the side. So there's insurance balls no matter what happens. And then, of course, if the cue ball happens to hit the, fifth, the 14 ball full and stops right there, he'll probably have a shot on either insurance ball. So th for those reasons, this is just an ideal shot. I would call this a bread and butter shot. It's the type of thing you want to look for in every rack of straight pool. Now, what happened? He did not manufacture a break ball. So this was the worst of all outcomes, but it's still okay. Why? Because he's got an insurance ball right there to shoot. So he's in no trouble at all. 
One ball got moved out of that cluster, and there's still no break ball, although I think the eight and this stripe are outside of the outline. It looks like the outline on the rack is right there. So one of those could possibly be used uh, as a break ball. But there is a situation here that you want to take notice of, and that is whenever you're looking for manufacturing a break ball, you're looking for two balls near the rack area that are diagonal. So if these two balls are diagonal for each other, and what that means is if you get the cue ball below or close to the shot line for the eight ball into this pocket, you can bump this ball and bump it over here to make a break ball. Likewise, if you get this, that angle on the six ball to shoot the six ball here, then you can bump the four ball over this way to make a break ball. So always look for those balls that are diagonally. Um, sometimes they'll not be diagonal. One ball will be here and the other ball will be directly above it uh, in the rack area. You can still, rather than bumping directly into it, you can still bump the edge of it and move it over and make it into a break ball. So that's the type of thing that, that John's looking at right now. And it's for that reason that he chooses to not shoot that 15. He chooses to shoot the two. Why would he do that? Three shot sequence. The two ball gets him on this angle on the tent, on this stripe to come over here and get on a ball that will let him manufacture a break shot. See that idea? Now, there's another thing that John did. I'll pause this real quick, and I think I mentioned this last week. Maybe I didn't. So this 15 ball in the side pocket was a really easy shot, right? Here's the cue ball, here's the 15. There's more than one way to play this shot. You could shoot below center softly and stun the cue ball and try and get it here. But you're going to find that straight pool players roll the ball more often than they stun it. So he's trying to get to a, to a, a specific location to, to manufacture a break ball. So he's playing short side position to a very small target zone. And you can arrive at that target position more precisely if you roll the ball and use outside spin. And so maybe I should even uh, try and play that shot over. Yeah, here we go. So it's not much of a cut shot, but let's watch and see. Yeah, he's aiming with a little bit of right English. Just roll the ball to get your position. The cue ball slows down faster, and you can play it more precisely. Now, John doesn't have a shot on the eight to bump this stripe, but he does have a shot on the stripe to bump the four ball over into break ball position. And that's exactly what he does. So by, by um, maneuvering the cue ball to the center of the table not, and not shooting off his insurance balls below, he left lots of options available. He could have bumped these balls in numerous ways to manufacture a break shot. That's what I picked up mostly from this rack. Now he's going to shoot the eight and play position for the six. That's real natural. And once that's done, uh, he's in the end pattern. The rack is completely solved, and he's in the end pattern. So ask yourself, what would you do? Here's the four ball. It's, it's in a really good location. It's away from the rack, and it's in a perfect break ball position. We're going to assume that this ball's the key ball because you can get a low angle and draw the cue ball over. You can get straight in and do that, or you can get this angle and go to the rail and over and get on your break shot. So that's an ideal key ball. So in that situation, I always say, look diagonal from the, from the key ball, what's the best K2 ball? Well, it might be the six, but he's played position for the six. And he does shoot the six next. I would probably consider shooting the 15 if it goes, and I think it goes by the 12, because you can come, you can bring the cue ball over here. You can shoot, let me erase these lines. You could bring the cue ball over here and off, then you have nearly a stop shot on the seven. Then you can shoot the six in and bring the cue ball two rails and have that angle on the 12. Is that too much cue ball movement for an end pattern? I think possibly it is. I think a lot can go wrong doing that. So what does John do? He shoots the six and it looks to me like he's gonna play position for the 15. And it does, but he also bumps the four ball. Now that's advanced level thinking, or is that too much bumping? Could that have gone wrong? I don't know. Uh, I think that's up for you to decide. He, may, he did make it much easier to get from the 12 ball into break ball position. 
And I've noticed a similar thing uh, during Jason Shaw's run, which is to say when he had a break ball that was already in a good spot, let's say right here, he would also often bump that ball farther from the rack. And I think there's an advantage to controlling the cue ball on the break shot when the break ball is, far, was, is farther from the rack. We're only talking a few inches. I'm not talking about a foot farther. But this is, uh, I think the diamond is, oh, I didn't draw a very straight line. The diamond is here. So the, the ball is, is uh, inside of the first diamond. But it's not this close to the rail. So uh, I'm going to have to look into that more. In my opinion, I think that's what he was trying to do. In other words, when you, when you don't have the opportunity to do that, you're going to just leave the break ball there and shoot it from there. But if you have the opportunity, this is a better break ball than the one that's closer to the rack because you can control the cue ball better. The cue ball has more time to come off the rack and curve to the bottom rail or, or something else. Anyway, what that does is dictate that the next shot is going to be the 15. Now, of course, he could shoot the 7, and then you'd have to maybe send the cue ball two rails like this to try and get get an angle on the 15 to get on the 12. That's a lot of cue ball travel. And what do you think, John, think right now, what, what do you think he would do, what would you do for as, to achieve minimal cue ball movement to get on this 12 ball on the side? You want the cue ball over, over here to shoot that 12. Almost a stop shot and then a straight drawback. And I think that's a high percentage play. We, uh, I think a lot of straight pool players, myself included, are looking to play that seven ball in the side pocket somehow. Maybe we're, we're thinking about shooting the 15 and following the cue ball forward and spinning the cue ball up here so we have this, you know, if the seven was here, then we could go down this way and get over there. I think it's following the principles of uh, minimal cue ball movement. The cue ball hardly moved when he shot the 15, and it was, it was super easy and 100% and certain that he was going to have the correct angle on the seven. And you don't have to be straight on that seven in the corner, even a slight angle you can still pull, pull the cue ball back this way, which is what he did. So that's a much higher percentage. I think that's the highest percentage play for that end pattern uh, for those reasons. Because now, look at this. He can barely even wait for the cue ball to stop moving because stop shot, such a simple shot. And he wouldn't have had a stop shot on that cue ball if he had left the four ball over here where it was. So all those things working together, they're very subtle things but I think there are purposeful thing, things that John was trying to achieve. Definitely some, uh, uh, things that I'm going to think about more as I'm uh, practicing and playing straight pool. Before wrapping up, I want to make a quick note at this end pattern because I know that I would not attempt to move the four ball here. And in that case, what's the best key ball for the four ball break shot? I'm going to go to the seven. The seven is probably a better one. And in that case, diagonally from the 7 takes you to the 12. So I like the pattern here, 6, is that the 11 ball maybe in the center of the table? 6, 11, 12, 7, I like a lot. I think that's very minimal cue ball movement. And it's 100% it's that you can go from the 12 to the 7 and get the perfect angle on that 7, which would be straight in, so you can just draw back a little bit for that break shot. This is an obvious one. He, John can't wait to shoot. Straight high ball. Uh, the cue ball is far from the rack. It could hit the bottom side of this stripe and go to the bottom rail or hit it full and curve around. And in this case, it went hit the bottom side. You saw it. You saw the cue ball back up, stall, and then curve forward again. That's what that uh, real good follow stroke on the cue ball does for you. Another great rack by John Schmidt.